Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the findings of the doctor's survey of over 15,000 physicians across 11 countries. My name is Dr. Sudhanshu Patwardhan, or SUD for short. I am the director and co-founder of the Center for Health Research and Education based in Hampshire, UK. Center for Health Research and Education, or CHRE, is a private healthcare company working on global cancer prevention projects. I'm also very honored to have two very senior tobacco control experts as panelists with me, and I'll be the third panelist as well as the moderator. So with that, we uh, we move to the next segment, which is Dr. Sally Sattel, who has very kindly recorded this despite uh, a lot of conflicts in the schedule. Uh, it was great to have her do the recording for us, uh, for the panel, I mean. And uh, if I may request the, uh, the host to please play that. A warm welcome to everyone. My name is Sally Sattel. I wish I could be here with you. Um, I'm a practicing psychiatrist, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and a lecturer at the Yale University School of Medicine. So today we're going to delve into a very important survey that's been commissioned by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. Um, it's an independent survey that's been done by one of their grantees, CERMO. It engaged 15,000 physicians from all over the world through 11 different countries. And the results were quite sobering. And they also underscore how much work we need to do in informing physicians of the truth. Let me tell you about the three main findings. The first finding is that 77% of physicians worldwide believe that nicotine causes lung cancer. The second finding is that these same doctors from across the globe have other misconceptions. For example, they believe that atherosclerosis is caused by nicotine. That's 78%. 76% said they believe that nicotine causes COPD. 72% believe that nicotine causes birth defects. And 70% say that it causes cancers such as bladder and gastric and head and neck. And finally, and here's some encouraging news, around 81% of physicians do express a keen interest in learning more about smoking reduction and cessation. Clearly, there is a pressing need for comprehensive education and awareness campaigns to ensure that medical professionals appreciate the nuances of nicotine in the context of health problems that are caused by combusted tobacco. That means smoking. Smoking is what causes the health consequences. And nicotine carries negligible health consequences. It's key for doctors to keep those two things separate in their mind, smoking versus nicotine. Also, doctors need to make sure that their patients who smoke are well informed about these differences, so they will be open to hearing about a range of smoking cessation therapies. I'm looking forward to this excellent panel discussion with a trio of distinguished experts who will talk about the survey itself and its implications for tobacco harm reduction. So thank you for joining the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World today. And thank you to the panelists for what I know will be an excellent discussion. Thank you so much, Sally, for the presentation. And also we are gonna miss you in this panel, but uh, we do hope that uh, this conversation the, the insights and the the learnings from the uh, the survey will allow us to have a, a very uh, interesting uh, discussion in the next 30, 30 40 minutes or so. Now, uh, I am very keen for uh, Professor Peloza and Professor Rose to uh, to join this conversation. Uh, I have kept them away from you for too long, and so if I may request, uh, well, Professor Peloza, uh, Ricardo, if you want to introduce yourself in a in a in a minute or so, and then uh, Jerry, please. Ah, yes. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. And my name is Ricardo Poloza. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Catania and founder of the Center of Excellence for the Acceleration of Arm Reduction at the same university. First and foremost, I'm a doctor and I've been always involved in uh, smoking cessation for quite a long time. In fact, I was the, I established the 
uh, first the smoking cessation centers in Sicily and uh, and our current smoking cessation center is one of the most active nationwide. So I also covered that angle from uh, expertise point of view. That's very helpful, Ricardo. Thank you so much for joining us on this. And I am looking forward to the discussion we'll have soon. Uh, Professor Jed Rose, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. And I've been interested in, uh, I originally got interested in nicotine and tobacco research as a as a young postdoctoral fellow at UCLA. And uh, when uh, I first got into the field, I thought uh, optimistically, perhaps naively, that within 10 years, we would solve the problem of tobacco addiction and cigarette smoking and uh, did not realize, but I think we've come to learn a lot about how the brain of uh, someone who smokes becomes literally transformed and the circuits become facilitated so much through the reinforcement from nicotine and perhaps other substances that, that it's such a tenacious addiction. And uh, in the very early days, I got um, interested in working on absorption of nicotine through the skin and the initial development of the nicotine skin patch, but very quickly realized that uh, it takes more than just replacing nicotine to really uh, curb a smoker's craving for the habit aspect of smoking. So over the years, over the decades, we've conducted a lot of studies to try to delineate how nicotine plays a role, the habit plays a role, they interact in complex ways, and um, and trying to develop ways to help smokers switch away from the deadly lethal form of, of uh, nicotine addiction, which is smoking combustible cigarettes. And uh, and I think the uh, I've reluctantly come to the conclusion that no short-term treatment works for the vast majority of smokers. Uh, a 12-week course of whether it's Chantix Brenicline or other treatments, uh, people that learning in the brain persists. And uh, so I'm very much a fan these days of rerouting behavior to an alternative, less harmful habit and helping smokers to retrain their they're craving to go to a less harmful source of nicotine, but I'm sure we'll talk more about those things later. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jared, and thanks, Ricardo, for uh, for reminding us that you were one of the uh, sort of initial uh, folks in the field who pioneered uh, looking at smoking cessation in the context of Catania and Italy and beyond, and, and Jared, with your work in the, uh, the, the invention of the nicotine patch, which is one of the key... Uh, tools in the toolkit for smoking cessation, but also uh, the very, uh, very humble, modest uh, admission there that, uh, yes, the 12 weeks are good, but uh, with the existing medications that we have in the portfolio and the toolkit. Uh, however, I, I would love to pick your brains on the, the whole rerouting, retraining of the mind for less risky nicotine products as a way to prevent current smokers, current users of risky forms of tobacco, I keep on saying, to also not forget those who consume smokeless tobacco in the likes of India and Pakistan, for example, to prevent them from going back to their risky habit. Uh, and I want to pick pick that up later in this conversation. But uh, let's let's use that as a way to say, okay, well, we understand that this is not a it, uh, not an easy problem to solve. Obviously, 1.3 uh, 1, 1. million tobacco users around the world, and uh, most of them know that their consumption of that product is going to harm their their lives, their dear people around them, uh, their economic condition. It, it harms them in so many different ways. And yet they continue consuming these products. And where do doctors come in this? Now, this whole doctor survey, and if I may sort of finish the question by saying, we did, uh, in, my, in my previous life, uh, I was the lead investigator on a study uh, nearly 15 years ago now, which found for the first time, I believe, and we published that, that doctors in the UK and Sweden, a small sample size, had these misperceptions. And, and, and there were some very obvious uh, roadblocks uh, in, their, in their minds about what these products can do, what nicotine replacement uh, can do uh, for, their, for their patients. Um, and fast forward 14 years now, and uh, thanks to the foundation's uh, investment in this uh, massive globally, uh, I would say, a global survey, uh, whether it's globally represented or not, we can ask uh, one of the uh, Q and A's is actually pointing to, can we have Australia as, as a future country to do a survey? And I think we should take that on as a later question as well. Uh, but it's a massive sample size. And looks like from what Sally presented, the misperceptions persist. Why is this important? 
who wants to take it? Ricardo, you or Jed first? Well, <laughs> clearly, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Um, the, the starting point is why we need to do this uh, with doctors and why is that is so important. Uh, we all know that traditionally doctors are trusted sources of medical information and advice, and they do really play a um, crucial role in helping patients adopting healthy behavior. So their opinions, their recommendations matters and carry significant weight with patients. We all know that. And not only with patients, but also with the general public. So I think this uh, survey that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is the, the, the first of this kind, the largest, the most global ever conducted in the history of tobacco control, is, uh, uh, is important because it assesses the level of knowledge and of understanding of smoking cessation and tobacco and reduction. And uh, if we do know that these doctors have that level of knowledge, well, then it, we are, um, uh, we are kind of uh, reassured that uh, we can count on them. However, if their level of knowledge is uh, um, is governed by misinformation and misconception, we should be uh, kind of uh, worried about it. Um, I, and I, I think, yes. and, and absolutely, I think that, that's that's the the take home message that we need to um, to think about. Thank you, Ricardo. Jed, please. Sorry. Yes, if, well, I just would like to to reinforce that the the key word I think one of the key words in what Ricardo said was trust. Indeed, the the trust that one places in the information one gets from a, a physician or, or other healthcare provider, and uh, and unfortunately, if they are um, misdirected, then it it will uh, lessen the chances that they can give up smoking. And just to cut right to one very specific instance. Uh, uh, the recent um, Cochrane review, you know, objective, thorough review of the evidence concluded that electronic nicotine delivery systems or so-called e-cigarettes were more effective than traditional nicotine replacement treatments like uh, nicotine patch. And yet uh, I'm sure that uh, most physicians uh, believe that the, the nicotine uh, being cancer causing and so forth uh, would look at an e-cigarette as being more like a conventional combustible cigarette than like a medicine and would often steer patients away from that, even though it looks like they're more effective. So that would be a case where the physician would unintentionally be doing harm to their very own patients. Yeah, well, that, I, I think this is a very interesting point. Um, I, I, I would like to keep this um, the discussion flow going. Um, and pick up on our brains where, where, where it comes. Um, uh, you know, the Cochrane, it seems that not many people uh, have been absorbing that kind of information. And certainly the several surveys is clearly proving that uh, this is the case. There is another point I would like to um, uh, emphasize in relation to doctors they are, that they are very well versed in smoking cessation and tobacco and reduction techniques. I truly believe that these doctors are better equipped than other doctors that don't possess the level of knowledge in, uh, in crafting personalized advice and recommendation to smokers. As you all know, Taylor made recommendation are the key for success in smoking cessation. Absolutely, Ricardo. I think this is one thing where we'll come to again, hopefully, in the in the conversation regarding what roles can doctor actually play when it comes to giving that customized tailor made advice. Let's take a few steps back, and I was going to ask uh, a rather personal question, Ricardo, particularly uh, given your medical training. But of course, uh, as a professor at uh, for a, for a good few decades, I'm sure Jed, you've seen this in your teaching. Uh, do medical textbooks teaching MD students cover nicotine properly? And do they, and I'm, this is a rather leading question because as a medical doctor myself trained in uh, India not that long ago, the textbooks 
in my case, uh, didn't necessarily go in the depth of what tobacco is, how is that different to nicotine versus smoking versus cancer? What was your experience uh, studying medicine, Ricardo, and teaching now as a, as a professor in Catania, but also, Jared, in, in terms of your experience as a, as a senior professor? Well, all the knowledge from nicotine comes from clinical uh, pharmacological uh, curriculum. <laughs> you know, all the nicotine knowledge that is uh, embedded in the university curricula for medical students comes mainly from clinical pharmacology. And all we learn from clinical pharmacology is uh, very basic stuff. You know, the nicotine is highly addictive, that can be poisonous at the high concentration. So it tells so all the, the very uh, negative sides of nicotine, never addressing the positive aspect of, of nicotine and let alone never discussing the potential for smoking cessation, as in the case of nicotine replacement therapies. So this is yep. a, a, a real uh, gap in most of university curricula. Of course, I try to patch this gap in my own university by, <laughs> by teaching my students in one or two uh, of my internal medicine lessons, some, uh, uh, some of, 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 you know, of, of the very basis of smoking cessation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. well, thank you so much. Uh, Jared? And, and, well, and it just reminds me, going back many decades, um, a, a very uh, prominent textbook that uh, that many medical students and doctors would refer to was Goodman and Gilman's uh, pharmacologic yeah. thesis of, of uh, therapeutics. And, uh, and it would say uh, something like uh, the lethal dose of nicotine was essentially two drops of nicotine uh, could kill, which turns out not, not to be true, but nicotine is quite uh, toxic and potent, uh, probably comparable to cyanide. But then a lot of medicines, uh, fentanyl uh, is very effective as a pain reliever, and yet many people die of fentanyl overdose, sadly, these days. So all medicines have their their toxic uh, overdose possibilities. Uh, but that does not seem to be much of a problem uh, with nicotine replacement methods. There are very few overdoses really of nicotine, but it, do, it does fit in with the notion that nicotine is always described from the negative dangerous <laughs> point of view. And uh, and I do remember when I was first putting nicotine on my skin as a young man, I, I did the calculations of dose very carefully. I'm yeah. glad you did that calculation right, because uh, it would be a great loss to tobacco <laughs> harm reduction if something had happened to you. But you make a great point there about the dose make it the poison. And of course, the products available, especially the licensed medical products, uh, nicotine replacement products in the marketplace today across the world, uh, the, the risk of that being uh, toxic unless willfully intentionally you know, consumed for that purpose. Are, are close to minimal. So that's an important thing to remind. But again, as you, you talked about the, the pharmacology texts of our time and the uh, the training given in clinical medicine is often, and this I always sort of say it partly in jest, but partly as a sort of tragic uh, irony there, that uh, most medical graduates uh, are better at diagnosing the most esoteric murmur you can hear from the heart, but are not equipped to give the right level of advice, not just prescribing nicotine replacement therapy, but also saying how to consume the gum. What is the chew and pop technique? How many patches do you need? Uh, can you combine a, a, a gum and a patch to manage cravings and, uh, uh, and, 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 and withdrawals? And so these are the sort of practical insights that doctors do need. And that's perhaps more important in terms of the, the impact they can have in the population than, and not to say that diagnosing a murmur is not important, but you know, the scale in the context. Actually, I'm quite shocked that uh, most of the curriculum in other areas of medicine are updated uh, at, uh, at a terrible fast pace. You know, if you talk about uh, oral antidiabetics or antihypertensive, they, they always the opportunity to talk of the very last minute drug that is being marketed. And in and instead of what uh, you know, Jed is saying, I've been studying the same textbook, <laughs> believe it or not, the John and the Gilman you're talking about, and there's been a stagnation in terms of teaching in the area of nicotine. And I, I'm not trying to defend my fellow pharmacologists, clinical pharmacologists. Uh, um, 
um, professors, but you know, they talk about pure nicotine, 99% pure nicotine. And of course, if you do talk about the 99% pure nicotine, you have to talk about poisonous, uh, of a poisonous substance. And as, uh, and as Sud was uh, emphasizing, is actually paraphrasing Paracelsus, is the dose that makes the poison. So the discussion needs to be reframed to take into account the uh, doses of nicotine they are normally consumed by, uh, by people. I, I have a, an interesting question that has been popped into the, the Q&A, and I think this might be a good chance to make it a bit more interactive and, and sort of listen to the audiences as such. And, uh, and the question reads, uh, Jed, how much do you think de-demonizing nicotine would help users to use by uh, users? I'm I'm assuming the the writer means tobacco users, current tobacco users, to use NRT effectively, to trust it and to use it to the strength and duration necessary. Do you want to have a go at it, Jed? And then of course, Ricardo, you can yes. uh, add on as well. Well, yes. I mean, I think that's very important because um, studies have shown that. Uh, patients underutilize NRT. They don't use it in sufficient dose or for long enough, perhaps even more importantly. Uh, they often don't use it for even the minimum recommended period of time. And, and the relapse or return to smoking is an inexorable curve uh, that takes place over the first several months, at least, if not, you know, to some extent over the first few years after in a quit attempt. So if people do not uh, continue using the treatment, then their chances of long-term success are unfortunately very small. And part of the problem is the demonization of nicotine. Uh, and so I, I completely agree with you uh, that, that the smoker, people who smoke themselves need to lose their fear of nicotine uh, and the stigma associated with using it as a medicinal treatment. But also, the products need to be more user-friendly to provide the satisfaction as e-cigarettes try to do because uh, there's very little um, reward to maintaining use of most medicines. And that's why adherence to whether it's antihypertensive uh, treatments or others is, is not all that good in general. People don't get much reward for using treatments, uh, even life-saving ones. And in this case, you know, preventing the return to smoking. Often people think once they get past the initial stage that they have succeeded when they really haven't because they're always at risk for at least many months of returning to smoking. So unless that alternative provides some rewarding aspects, uh, they're not likely to continue using it. But certainly taking away the stigma of nicotine will help them, you know, to be encouraged to use it uh, for a longer time than they may think they need it, but that they really do need to uh, continue with use. Thank you so much, Jed. You want to add something, Ricardo? Yeah, for once, I I feel to disagree <laughs> with you guys. I mean, I take my European perspective, which may be completely different from the US-centric vision of uh, nicotine-containing products, including NRTs. I don't think the demonization has nothing to do with the failure of uh, nicotine patches in gum in Europe to be honest. I mean, they are un underutilized for a couple of other reasons. One, because people don't feel they need to be uh, medicalized uh, for smoking. Secondly, because uh, some of these drugs uh, usually are uh, not uh, uh, covered by, uh, you know, um, um, recompensation schemes, pay payment schemes, and, and so they are paid out of the pocket. And many of my patients will simply and plainly tell me, well, I, I better go and buy myself another pack of cigarettes rather than, <laughs> than medication in me quitting smoke. It's a cultural thing. I can take that. But, uh, you know, this is a very important point. I think one of the main problems is that they are fairly ineffective. You know, o OCTs, NRT, uh, are terribly un ineffective. They they just need uh, motivation, willpower, and some 
counseling and assistance from a doctor, a friend, or your spouse, and that will make it a little bit more effective. But I don't think demonization of nicotine has nothing to do with the patches or gum. Maybe demonization of nicotine has to do with the other products such as electronic cigarette, heated tobacco products, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I think, uh, just think of marijuana, Mar marijuana has been banned even in Italy for a long time. Now it's back in fashion. May, we, are, we are following the mainstream from US. But I think one of the reasons why now marijuana is not uh, uh, seen as a big evil is simply because it's been medicalized. You know, medicalization of marijuana made a big change in the mind of many people. They can see that this... Uh, the chemicals contained in marijuana can do a lot of good, particularly in some areas like multiple sclerosis or control of uh, of pain and so forth. So I really think that by shifting the the focus from uh, from uh, you know um, nicotine that can be a poison to nicotine that can be. A, a, a therapeutic agent will, uh, you know, will uh, enhance popularity of uh, nicotine-containing products in general. Yeah. Well, so, Ricardo, so thank can you. I, oh, so can I no, just no, please. pick up on the aspect of maybe rather than say demonization of nicotine, maybe the 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 key element which discourages smokers from using it uh, indefinitely or, or for a sufficiently long period of time is, is really the negative stigma of being addicted or dependent on the drug. Um, and, and so uh, people don't like to be addicted. So once they feel that they have shaken free of their addiction to cigarettes, they don't want to be addicted to nicotine in any form. But if they could be um, told that it's actually a good thing to transfer your addiction or dependence from the harm, most harmful source, cigarettes, to a safer source. And I mean, an analogy, which unfortunately would not probably be uh, a convincing analogy to use with a patient, but between us, the analogy would be with a, a, a heroin addicted individual who transfers to methadone. Uh, they're still dependent on an opioid, but it's a much less harmful opioid than uh, injecting intravenous heroin. Um, of course, this, somebody who smokes cigarettes does not want to be compared to someone who injects heroin, I know. But but uh, but the principle is the same, is that being addicted or dependent uh, is, is, the, is the sad reality. I mean, that's the state. So the question is, are, are you going to be addicted and die of your addiction, or are you going to uh, live disease-free, except you will remain addicted to nicotine? And I think for many smokers, the choice should be, I will remain addicted to nicotine, but I will not die of that because I will obtain my nicotine in a clean, non-combustible way. And that is a compromise to be sure, but for most smokers, uh, the alternative is going back to cigarettes. Yeah, Jed and, and Ricardo, thank you so much for that uh, that little uh, conversation that was never gonna go into a big fight. I could see that there was no disagreement actually. There was, uh, uh, I was gonna disagree with Ricardo for disagreeing with you because I thought, you know what, actually you're saying the same thing on a broader spectrum of uh, issues regarding access to safer nicotine, be it in the form of uh, the perception around it, be it the form of whether it's medically licensed or not and available at price points which people can afford. And a simple example, if you look at uh, countries such as India or go anywhere in the LMICs, the low and middle income countries around the world, which, by the way, I have to remind the audiences and everybody that 80%, 80% of the world's current tobacco users live in low and middle income countries. And the access to affordable and available nicotine replacement therapy, forget electronic cigarettes and nicotine pouches, even basic what one would call essential medicines list, and that's what the WHO calls NRTs, the access to that is very poor. It's minimal. Uh, go to one of the largest cities, and I was in South Asia, I was in Bangladesh, in Dhaka. I, I like to tell the story, unfortunately, where I went to one of the largest pharmacy shops there and said, oh, well, can I just have a look at what nicotine replacement products you have? And then there was a bit of a scramble there among the staff to go and find it. And uh, 10 minutes later, they said, yeah, we used to have some gums that we used to get imported from somewhere, and now we don't have them. 
and and this is a state of affairs in a country which has millions of tobacco users uh, go to india the same story and so i think the the issue about affordability and access, accessibility to just nicotine replacement remains a big hurdle and if i can just add one more uh, data point based on the work we are doing thanks to the foundation's funding in south asia we are using what we have what we have available there so we cannot and we do not promote products like electronic cigarettes because they are banned especially in india but even with nicotine replacement therapy with the right kind of advice right counseling and empowering the doctors who are actually prescribing the medication for long enough we have found some staggeringly amazing positive results in terms of quitting and uh, so far also in terms of relapse prevention so it is possible to make nrt work uh, it needs a lot of effort and there are it's a multifactorial thing is as a view i've kind of come to and i think what i'm hearing from the two of you is also the doctors have to be better informed they have to feel confident about prescribing it they need to know how to prescribe it as well not just say okay here is my prescription for you go and let the pharmacist tell you what to do and the pharmacist is attending 25 uh, customers there she is not going to bother about giving them this sort of sit down okay here is how you chew and how you park it so that's a bit of practical personal experience uh, but i do know that we have to go back to the doctor's survey and think with all these various factors we have talked about obviously so, so the you hit the, you, you hit the nail there you know a doctor that doesn't know the drug will never prescribe the drug if i don't know an is an electronic cigarette i will never recommend an electronic cigarette what makes me different from the other counselors in my area is that i know the product very well so that i can i can recommend the product because i know all the pros and cons if somebody doesn't know the drug and that applies to every field in the medical profession including you know di- diabetes if you don't know a glp1 inhibitor you're not going to prescribe it for sure you stick to your good old metformin absolutely no, that's a great point and look i'm uh, i'm also conscious that we had a great question earlier from the audiences i would love to have some more questions uh, i do have a few in my back pocket but i would love to hear the audiences ask but before they do so or while they do so i was going to ask so we know now that there is a massive gap but i think the 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 one positive thing from this the survey among 15000 doctors in 11 countries is that there is an appetite from what we hear from the survey there is an appetite among the physicians 81% of the physicians are interested of those surveyed uh, as per the survey are interested in smoking cessation and tobacco harm reduction training so now the question for you two experts and i'm happy to chip in afterwards what strategies could be employed to enhance their knowledge we talked about the curriculum initially but anything else we can do practically to to get them uh, this extra additional new training shall i start please ricardo okay i mean besides the obvious uh, um you know um continuous medical education pathway that uh, we can follow uh, i would like to be a little bit more bold and innovative a, a way to um to in empower knowledge is to use uh, consensus so for example uh, uh, methodology like delphi consensus can be used in for example in in the 11 countries where these surveys being conducted you know they can they methodologist uh, uh, the delphi methodologist can take the survey they create statement they make questions and this question can be returned to the let's say the physicians in that particular country to come with the responses and this is a good way to try and engage with the doctors they know very little about smoking cessation and tobacco and reduction and try to instill some level good level of literacy in them both in tobacco and reduction and in smoking cessation so i i would push for delphi consensus methods in order to uh increase the level of uh, uh literacy in the doctors thank you ricardo jed uh yeah i i totally agree with ricardo uh certainly the yeah continuing medical education for for example i know that uh family practice physicians uh 
uh, have to uh, attend um, conferences for updated training and, uh, uh, you know, and they're, they're out there on the front lines uh, seeing, uh, seeing patients who smoke. And uh, so conferences could present the latest on uh, smoking cessation treatment techniques at those meetings. Um, we need inroads to that community. And, and let's also be honest about the barriers, which is uh, that <clears throat> unfortunately, there is a well-coordinated uh, opposition movement that, that uh, disseminates distorted information about things like electronic cigarettes that makes it seem like they're as bad, if not worse than combustible cigarettes. Um, so it's going to take more effort when you have um, uh, opposing forces misinforming the audience than if you just have a naive, simple audience to reach. So it it, it will take, you know, obviously funding and resources to reach out and try to um, build the consensus, as Ricardo was saying, and present an objective consensus um, uh, around the use of different forms of nicotine replacement, and uh, and then get that into the uh, the ears and brains of of the medical professionals. Um, so uh, quite a challenge, but indeed that that needs to be done. No, I mean, the, the, the whole objective is not to reach a consensus per se, but is to have uh, an informed discussion. So maybe people, they are sitting on the fence and they don't really know where to look. They may see the light eventually. Uh, another important point when uh, talking uh, about this, uh, continue, continuous medical uh, education specifically is... Uh, that this needs to be tailored to specific professional interest. For example, if I want to talk about uh, smoking cessation or harm reduction in uh, diabetic uh, people who smoke, yeah, that would be uh, important for the uh, diabetologist. And the same if I, I want to bring out the topic of cardiovascular patient who smoke for cardiologists, of course, I would not talk about the respiratory problems to diabetologists, and I would not deal uh, of uh, the problem of diabetic who smoke with the respiratory physicians. No, I think the, the need to customize uh, to make it very bespoke and tailor-made, uh, and also the point about consensus, not necessarily consensus seeking, but also sharing evidence base that is available. And, and anecdotally, I can assure you that uh, part of my frustration, and we have seen the data from 11 countries, and uh, all of them fare pretty, uh, pretty poorly in terms of doctors' current misperceptions, not because of their lack of desire to get trained on this or to keep updated. It's just the nature of the beast. Doctors are uh, looking at, practicing physicians are looking at hundreds of new molecules coming to their uh, their, their practice for them to prescribe. You mentioned diabetes earlier, uh, uh, Ricardo, and I think doctors have to keep continuously updated. I think nicotine somehow fallen through the cracks over the years, and they've in a way used available knowledge from their medical training, or oftentimes lay public, which kind of brings me to a question I wanted to kind of merge one that's been asked by the uh, by the audiences, which is, what would be your proposed solutions to improve physicians' awareness and understanding of the role of nicotine in tobacco harm reduction? Along with another question I had really uh, bubbling in my mind about what kind of partnerships or collaborations do we need to have, uh, not just with physicians uh, and other other researchers and, 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 and communities, but also beyond physicians. So in the general public, who do we need to partner? Jed? Yeah, well, on the first part of that, that question, I mean, I'm just thinking more about, you know, it's more than the usual sort of um, approach of presenting information in an interesting way. Right, because there there is this counter force that has already implanted you know, mythology into the smoker's brain that needs to be somehow uh, rooted out. And and so, for, just as an analogy, for example, um, you know, there's an anti-vax vaxer movement, people who are against vaccines. And uh, uh, recently, I was talking with someone who was uh, pointing out the supposed dangers of the COVID nineteen vaccine. Uh, because uh, we haven't studied the long-term consequences of the of the COVID vaccine. Well, of course, the clinical trials, you know, of many thousands of people show a 90% reduction in death rate from COVID when people receive active vaccine versus placebo vaccine. Well, by analogy, you know, people say with e-cigarettes, well, we haven't studied the long-term effects of e-cigarettes. And yet again, in the Cochrane Review, 
the clinical trials show a clear advantage. So it almost takes, you know, a real discussion and maybe parallels where because everybody has heard these these arguments that there are there exist toxins in e-cigarettes. Well, of course, there exist toxins in everything. If you look hard enough, you will find toxins in your, you know, everything you touch. So it, it's almost a, a broader education that is required than simply presenting information because it's it's almost how to think about your world and evaluating evidence and seeing the parallels between this situation of nicotine use and other situations in medicine where people accept, you know, certain conclusions that vaccines are good, you know, even if we don't know the long-term, uh, all the long-term data 10, 20 years from now, we have enough evidence now to justify their use. You know, trying to teach, it's, it's really a training in how to evaluate evidence and avoid being, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, susceptible to distortions by highly motivated anti-groups. And, and that's that's a real challenge. So I think the the training is has got to be very specialized training in in how to look at evidence and not just sort of the simple presentation of facts. Uh, in terms of the the modality for reaching the physicians, uh, I am, you know, I'm not a physician. I'm a, uh, so I would defer to Ricardo and you and other physicians about the best conduits to uh, the communication process. Yeah, I can just add one thing. Thank you so much for that, Jen and Ricardo both. And I'm kind of uh, looking at, on one side, I'm looking at the clock and it's ticking away. And I'm feeling now the audience is getting very excited and they're putting in a lot of comments and questions. Let if me I read can one say of them. something, one minute, um, uh, Sud. In relation to your specific question, how do we need to enhance this knowledge? What, what are the avenues that we need to uh, follow. Uh, I think it, it, the logical thing is to get uh, uh, doctors' organization involved. Otherwise, this all operation uh, will not be uh, felt credible. Um, and the second point is to get patients' associations involved. So people, they need to know firsthand from key opinion leaders, they are knowledgeable about tobacco and reduction and smoking cessation, what's seen for their patients. Absolutely. I think the patient advocacy in this, and uh, that's perhaps a much larger conversation, but thanks for picking on that point about those who have experienced the effect and the impact of peat nicotine replacement, which is uh, given the, the issues we discussed about appeal or availability or affordability or the way it was used and prescribed uh, or any other nicotine replacement, safer nicotine product, those are the real champions, and uh, it is difficult to undermine their story for sure. And they become really powerful advocates. And how do we feed that back in? And and that kind of segues into a very interesting uh, observation made by one of the audiences, which is uh, countries like the UK are great places for clinicians to come. This is from other countries, I presume. So from other low and middle income countries or around from around Europe, for that matter. I know that. Uh, Germany, for example, there's a lot of resistance to tobacco harm reduction uh, implementation, unlike the UK. So for clinicians from other countries to visit the UK and see firsthand, get firsthand experience in how tobacco harm reduction and, and nicotine products, be it nicotine replacement therapy, e-cigarettes, nicotine pouches, how are they made available, what combination they're used in, uh, and, and just giving smokers a vast choice. And, uh, and and the obvious impact in terms of population level reduction in smoking prevalence. I think uh, sharing country experiences uh, couldn't be, uh, there, there's nothing more powerful than sharing such experiences from the UK with a, a whole bunch of countries globally, not just with clinicians, if I may add, and I have my eye also on the, uh, the upcoming conference in Panama, the COP10. And I hope that countries such as the UK uh, go and talk positively about their what I would like to call enlightenment with tobacco harm reduction. And oftentimes uh, uh, the, the, the folks who visit uh, or who represent this country are quite modest in how they, uh, they talk about it. They should be shouting from the rooftop. And, and which brings me to uh, two points, uh, one more point there by one of the audiences about why is the FDA or the WHO or the EU, why are they not more open about this fact that nicotine does not cause cancer and, and that's a great question uh, it's from a from a gentleman in, in Sweden and uh, that's a great question to ask uh, and it goes back to uh, what are the agenda behind uh, why some of the misinformation is spread a great question a comment by uh, another person from uh, from Catania uh, when NRT was first introduced there was a big pushback against it 
And that's a great point. And is there any learning from that now that NRT, at least NRT products are accepted by clinicians for at least for a short term use, uh, not notwithstanding the, the challenges with long term use. So there is some perhaps some transferability there in terms of uh, ideas. There's two well, more well, comments. Oh, yeah, well, just on, on that fact. So one, you know, there was pushback and it took years. But uh, let's remember that the, the companies that were manufacturing the NRT products were pharmaceutical companies. Uh, in the case of electronic cigarettes, it's uh, tobacco. They're viewed as tobacco companies. So there's a lot more negative baggage and people then have emotional reactions to the, uh, to the industry, which gets in the way of interests for the patient. And, and that just makes another barrier. Yeah, look, I, I see the last comment there and I see there's five minutes before we wrap up. So I'm going to use the last comment to make a, a little sort of a conclusion statement, if I may. And I know that you would have loved to, uh, we could have gone on for another hour, I'm sure, Ricardo and Jed and the audiences. But I, I love what the last question uh, sort of in, in a very interesting way kind of says, well, who is the best messenger for this? And uh, I've been also uh, given some good good clarity and direction by the folks who have funded and uh, funded this research, the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, and they've very gently, kindly reminded me that uh, this is not the end of the work. I think this is the beginning of the work. So if you look at the findings from you know, 15,000 physicians, 11 countries, all that data is, uh, is available in a very structured fashion on the Foundation website. So uh, uh, they one could go on the smokefreeworld.org website and very easily, quickly find links to all the 11 countries' data uh, in an amazing tabular format, in amazing formats, and sliced and diced in different ways. But I think there is also an important need at this point, going back to who is the best messenger. I think, uh, uh, Jed, you mentioned, uh, I'll come to you, Ricardo, in a second. Jed, you mentioned that tobacco industry uh, logically may be the one, but of course, given the history, uh, there are barriers and maybe not the right folks. Uh, I'll finish by saying, but then I'll wait for Ricardo to actually maybe just say something in a minute, if you don't mind, Ricardo, please. 30 seconds. The best messenger is us, not us, me and Jed, is us doctors. Peer-to-peer -peer is a, such a powerful thing. If I start using a drug and I see that it's working, I will discuss with my colleagues and I will tell, look, this is uh this is working uh, you know the blood pressure of these guys is, is going down uh, pretty quickly and is stabilizing the same can happen with the tobacco and reduction tool if i see results for myself i can share the experience with other pe people so the messenger is us doctors absolutely i think uh, and if i may jed with your permission ricardo with your permission uh, i may summarize by saying look uh, there is an opportunity that has been opened up now with this very clear uh, uh, non-equivocal finding from this survey, which is there is a huge gap in terms of perceptions and there is huge misperceptions among the a key trusted community, which is physicians uh, who do influence patients or, or smokers' behaviors in terms of choices they make. And uh, it is for credible, independent researchers to, to look at the evidence and package it in a way and present it in a way that People can understand in a bite-sized fashion if required, but for them to practically apply it to their practice, uh, in this case, physicians. Uh, one final thing to say, if I may, uh, is that the foundation is actually calling for proposals. And here is a chance for those who have listened to this now, but also subsequently offline, should go on the foundation website, but also write to support at smokefreeworld.org. And there is uh, on queue, there is the email address there. And so that will be a great way for the, the broader community in public health, be it clinicians, uh, researchers, academics, uh, new res young researchers, uh, investigators from around the world, especially low and middle income countries to write to the foundation and, and suggest ways to make a difference. At the end of the day, uh, lives of not just 1.3 billion current smokers and users of tobacco products are at stake. It's the lives of billions more who live with these people who are part of this broader ecosystem and uh, what better way to have a healthier happier future than to uh, be smoke free and free from risky tobacco products but that's not going to happen by just wishing it it needs a lot of hard work behind and i hope that uh, this becomes a trigger for that so ricardo thank you so much 
Jed, thank you so much for being on this panel. Uh, I wish we had a much longer time, but if you want to just say thanks and bye, please do. <laughs> thank you, Sue. Thank you very much for your excellent moderation. Excellent moderation, and, and thank you for having me. Thanks. No, thanks no, thanks to the foundation for hosting this, and uh, to the audiences, please let it uh, keep on come. Uh, let it uh, come to us, to the foundation, and we do meet in conferences, and this is an, an important community that needs to come together to make a real positive impact in public health. So thanks for attending and listening. Those uh, on the on that side of the, con uh, of the globe, have a good night, and those who have just woken up in California, have a good day. Thank you so much, and bye all.